Don's good. Don's good for everyone. Yeah, okay. Um, so thank you, all the time. Thank yes, you. what we do is um, Hi, and I'm Tom. we we yeah. know that uh, in order to receive, uh, we have to get clean. So since this is heavy, this this topic, this isn't just going to be a sermon. It's going to be it's going to be thick. And so um, I want you to confess your sins, not out loud, but just to confess your sins before the Lord, as we all do. And then Don will start with prayer when I talk to you. So uh, confess your sins. Think about what you've done wrong. You've had three months to really mess up. <laughs> three months since you've been, been here. So well, to speak of that, has anybody confessed in those three months? Have you guys done any? Have, have you ever? Has anyone ever asked you to confess anything? I'm okay to tell you about that. No. <laughs> <laughs> so let's confess our sins in silence. You know, you know how I always deal and struggle with hate, right? You know, you and I go back and forth about the hating concept. And this Putin character, I hate this guy. I hate him. I've been watching him. I've been, you know, my wife's Lithuanian, so, you know, she comes from that whole regime over there, and she knows what's going on in Putin's game plan. And I see this, and I, I hate this guy. Even yesterday in the devotional in basketball, I go, guys, I try not to hate. I try to love on everybody, but I... In my heart, I just have a hard time finding any love for this Putin character whatsoever. I think he's evil. I think he's just a, a, a no good, rotten SOB, if you will. So, and I'm really affected by it because I'm watching. And I never really tuned into the, the past things like this. Like I'm so probably because of Lithuania. My wife's mother is still there at the age of 80 years old. They're worried about obviously an occupation and Russia coming out and strong arming them also. So I struggle with that. And you talk about getting clean. And I, you got to get clean from the hate, too. Do we not? <clears throat> Welcome aboard, Janice. <laughs> <laughs> so it's something I'm struggling with because I really detest well, this guy. There, there, that, that's a whole lesson on hate. And I talked about that in one of our men's groups, okay? Um, that God hates. He tells us to hate. You're supposed to hate. But society is telling us, oh, you got to love everybody. Well, what is the definition of love? Well, if I love you, if I, I love you, I include you. Okay, I love my wife, so I include my wife in my life, right? So if I, anything I love, think of love as inclusion. I include. But that which I hate, I don't include. So my, my view of love and hate is hate, I include people. I mean, love, I include people. Okay? <laughs> hate, I exclude them. And I exclude people all the time. I, I hate Putin. I'm, I'm not going to invite Putin to this deal. I, Putin's not invited. Okay? Now, if he comes in and confesses a sin, that's a, a different case. Okay? So that, that's a whole other topic. It, it's, a, it's a deep topic. I, pastorally, I have no problem with hating. But my view is is different than than common people. So so you you look at it, oh, you're supposed to love everybody. We're supposed to love everybody, right? Right. Is that, is that what you've been taught? It, it, have you been taught to love everybody? Have you been taught that? I, I have in fact my her hate is actually, I guess in the Greek it's less devoted to somebody or something. 
Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Less to vote. Yeah. I, I, I exclude them, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's certain. I, I I'm not. I, I just don't include. Now, sometimes I can't help it. I'm in a room and I'm with people that I hate, right? And I get along with them. But I'm certainly not going to invite them, right? Uh, of course, then you get into well, Rick, you're not. You're supposed to evangelize, right? Right. <laughs> But then on the other hand, Jesus said, don't throw your pearls to swine. Right. Right? So it, it's not an easy topic. And maybe we should spend a, a session on it. But right now, we're going to talk about okay. this session. I just okay. need to get that off my chest. Thank you for listening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. He also says, flee evil. Um, yeah. it, you have been so given a book. Evil. And I would like to tell you what this book is. Since we've been meeting last year about theology, um, for you who come regularly, are you gonna, is this your first time? Or? Yeah, first time. We're glad, you're, who do you know here? That man over there. Oh, no, oh, gee, oh, 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 and it's called Concise What? Theology. Yeah. Theology. Okay? In this book, I have found this book very helpful to me. Um, you will see a number of words defined. So, for example, if you look at the contents, revelation. What is revelation? What is interpretation? Uh, guilt for, and read through those, and you can see. So if you need to know a theological term, you have a definition of it now. You have it. Nice. So my goal is for you to be able to speak theologically. So you can so you can communicate your ideas, what you've learned in this group. And you have a vocabulary. You have a vocabulary. Because so many Christians, well, many, I'd say most Christians, don't have a Christian vocabulary. You, you can't talk, you can't explain, you can't explain what um, hamartiology is, for example. You can't explain porterology, you can't explain, but well, what's the difference, what is sacred and what is holy? You, you, you don't have the words, and actually when I went to Wheaton, that's what they said. Shut up and sit down, Rick, you don't know anything. <laughs> so I had to shut up and sit down, and they said, we're going to teach you language, and we're going to teach you Theological terms, how to speak theologically. So this book is a great little reference book. Well, it's not a little reference. It's a great book for understanding the two natures, like uh, part two, 40, the two natures of Jesus, fully human and fully divine. And we talked about that a couple <clears throat> weeks ago, or four months ago, when we talked about what did Jesus give up to be incarnate? What did he give up? We call it kenosis, Right? Call the, now, you might not remember, but, we, but you were taught it. You were taught it. So that we call that kenosis, or kenotic theory, kenosis. And he gave up his glory to come down here. So he's fully divine. He's fully human. He's both fully divine and fully human. And that's his two natures. So as you read this, you just read one or two at a time and, and, and think about it, right? So this is for you people who've been coming for a while, okay? So if you want to come back, I'll, I'd be happy to do it. But this book has helped me. And it was a book at, at Wheaton. They said, you got to know what you're talking about. You, you can't get out of here and not know how to talk theology. You have to be ta able to talk about uh, um, what is the mercy seat? What is expiation? What is propitiation? Okay? Has anyone heard of those two words, expiation and propitiation? Have you even heard of them? Have you ever heard of them? Okay. Most of you probably don't know what they are. But next week after Kathy finishes, since we're preparing for Easter, I'll explain expiation and propitiation and the mercy seat. What is the mercy seat? Now, does anybody know what the mercy seat is? What's the mercy seat, Dave? Mercy seat is on top of the Ark of the Covenant. And Jesus is the mercy seat. So Jesus sits on top of the mercy seat to prevent God's wrath from coming out and he prevents our sin from going in. He prevents expiation and prevents propitiation. 
That's the mercy seat. Now, I just gave you an hour's lecture at Wheaton in, in two, two and a forth, okay? So what I, the reason I give you this book, beloved, the reason I, I want you to be able to talk theology, to be able to, not with me, with people you meet, and for them to see that, holy mackerel, that, that rich wolf guy, he, he, knows, he knows what he's talking about. I, I don't, I, I can't keep up with the guy. Oh, that Willard, he, he's, he's got a language, he, he can talk about this stuff. So this book is a help me for them, okay? All right. um, tonight's lesson is about creation's views, and the reason I'm doing this is to prepare for the guy who's going to be here in two weeks. His name is Dr. John Wall, and he is the author of two books, which has made him famous in the, the theological world. I mean, John Walton is no small potato, okay? Uh, John knows he's pretty good, but Walton, is he, you know him, Rich? Did you meet the guy? I did meet him, yeah. Why don't you tell your story? I'll tell it when he's here, no, so I can refresh his memory too and they don't have to hear it twice. Okay. <laughs> so these are his two books, and the reason I'm bringing him in is he's going to come at you with a different view of creation. That you're gonna that that you you probably have never looked at it this way before. I'll give you the brief. He doesn't care about the stuff. He doesn't care that the world was created. He cares about the function. What was it created for? And that's his premise. I just I just gave you Walton. So he 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 doesn't care if you're. A young earth cre creationist that the earth was just created 2,000 years ago, it's, it's brand new, okay? Or if it's multi billions and trillions of years ago, he doesn't care. Because for him, the scriptures that he reads, the, how he interprets the Old Testament, nobody cares what was made or when it was made. What and when is irrelevant. What's important to him is why and how. And you're going to see that in my presentation because I've torn down his two books. Because I've, I've been through these books a couple times now, both of them. And I'm going to give you Walton so when he comes, you will know basics of what he's talking about. So he asked me, he said, Rick, do any of them have my books? <laughs> I don't think you do. I don't think you do. But I'm going to teach you his books tonight so when he comes, you can say, yeah, we know all about you. Okay? And then he doesn't have to he doesn't have to, have to repeat the process. Okay? And so we'll be able to get even deeper with him because he will not have to cover the basics. I'm going to cover his basics for him. And then Kathy, Kathy Wellman, she's going to cover next week literary devices which go into uh, Walton's expertise. So how does he get this view of his uh, creation from this? How does he do it? The way he uses literary devices to interpret scripture. And, as I said, the Bible was not written for us. It was not written to us. It was written for us. It's not a Bible to us. So he, he looks at culture as I, as I do. It's, this Bible was not written for us. That written not to us. It wasn't written to us. It was written to people back when it was written. Okay? Now keep in mind, this is will blow your mind. Moses wasn't born until, what, 1450 or so B.C.? How did he know what was created 2,000 years before him, 1,000 years before him, or however long it was before him? How did he know? He wrote, he wrote Genesis, where we attribute it to him. So how does he know what happened at the creation? Because he wasn't born until 1450 B.C., what about 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 BC? Before Christ. Okay. What about how does he know that? How does how does how does how does Moses know all this stuff? What makes what makes our Bible so special? So Walton is going to come and show you some of the other ancient writings that were with the Bible. The Akkadians, the, 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 the Babylonians, that they had these cultures that they had, they wrote too. And they had a noatic experience. 
all of the ancient writings have a flood. Not just, not just, the, not just the Bible. So when you look at these ancient writings, and, and that's what Walton knows. Okay, so he's going to come with a, a different kind of a, a, a view. So you may get ticked off at him because you may not agree with his view. But I'm going to tell you what his view is now, so you won't get ticked off when he gets here. So you don't throw <laughs> throw an eggs at him. Okay. okay. We're here tonight, Janice. We worship the Lord with our minds. We think. We think about what we believe. We know what we believe and we know why. And some of us, me in particular, I always have to keep on learning things. Because I, I, I think I got something right. And then I learned something. Oh, that was wrong. And most of it comes from my church upbringing. And most of it is like, well, I learned that in the church. And then I found out, oh, that, that's not true. That's not true. So this is not to bash, we're not here to bash churches, okay? But we're here to think about what we have come to believe and say to ourselves, yeah, I don't think I believe that anymore, right? We can bless for cleanliness, and then we have the opening prayer. Okay. Here is where we've been. Our first classes, we talked about Bible translations. Then I introduced you to Judaism. We talked about Hebrew culture. We talked about the Apocrypha, the Interpenitent Method. What's the Apocrypha, somebody? The Catholic. Show, the show, let's, show Janice, let's show Janice how smart we are. Uh -oh. let's just, let's just What's the Apocrypha? It's the 500 years that are actually in the Bible itself. Between the, between the Testaments. Between the, yeah, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the Apocrypha is in the Catholic Bible, but is it in the Protestant Bible? No. No, it's not. Okay. <laughs> uh, we talked about Judaism and the importance of the destruction of the temple. Uh, we talked about the Romans and the Pharisees, and we went through the Zealots. You learned all about the Zealots, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all that. Um, inter interesting. You found out that there is not one gospel. There is not one gospel. There are nine gospels, okay? Which come to a shock. I think that was a shock a little bit to you, Susan. I think you were like, what's he talking about, right? And so you find out there's, there's nine different gospels that are mentioned in the scriptures, okay? Paul's letter. We talked about Hebrews, how the Jews became Christians, how, how the Jews, they, they, we, we don't go this anymore. And so they said, we, we're not going back to the temple. We don't, we're not going back and, and doing that sacrifice. We're not, I don't want to kill another cow. I don't want to do that anymore. I don't have to because Jesus was the sacrifice, final sacrifice, no more cow shedding, no more uh, any of that. Okay. Um, then we had Dan Keaty come in. Remember Dan came in and told us about Peter and fishing and told us to kind of fish. I don't remember what kind of, you remember? King, uh, salmon, uh, King Salmon, Cull Hall, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we then talked about the different views of communion, the Catholic view, Orthodox view, the Lutheran view, the Presbyterian view, and the Baptist view. We talked about those different views. And I don't know what you guys have come to believe. I don't know how you take your communion now. I don't know if you stop taking communion at a church. I don't know what you believe in communion. But there's different views of communion. Obviously, I'm, I don't take my communion at Catholic Church. I, I just won't do that. That's all. I just won't do it. Because they believe in something different than what I believe. And I wouldn't bring my theology into their church. I'm not going to do it. We talked about the spiritual presence. Uh, we talked about Hamar theology, the study of sin. We talked about ponderology, the study of evil. And we had, we talked about John Noe came in. We talked for four weeks we spent preparing for Noe to come in to talk about evil. And I don't know, but I think some of you guys are still going, I don't know about this Noe guy. <laughs> and you're not too sure about this guy. Okay. So Noe came in and talked about evil. We talked about theophanies, manifestations, the presence of God. And so I shared with you that I've seen Jesus. Remember I told you? I, I, for me, it happened. Okay? Um, manifestations and the presence of God. One of the things we believe here, Janice, is that when two or three are gathered, Jesus is here. So he's, he's sitting next over here. Okay? But he'll probably move over there later. So we believe... That, that when Jesus says he'll be there, yeah, he, and we are gathering. So we're gathered, right? And, and so he's here. 
We talked about cessation and continuation. That means, uh, well, somebody tell me what that means. Uh, about they, miracles, if, do they still happen today as they did? They can be spared if they still continue. Yes, yes. The, so when you're with somebody and you ask them, have miracles ceased? They say, yes, they have. And you say, well, I'm a continuationist. You can use, you can use that word, right? And they'll look at, so what, 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 what? So we, we covered that. We talked about councils and creeds, the doctrines, the threshing floor. Don gave an outstanding presentation on, on the threshing floor and the east gate. So I, I still think about that presentation, and, and it was so good, Don. Um, Brian Oswald came in and spoke on angelology. We talked about the Constitution, our body, soul, and spirit. How many of you are duo or tri? What are, what are you guys? Dave, what do you consider yourself? Three? Willard? Three. Three? Rich? Three. 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 We talked about your spirit and the Holy Spirit, uh, the image and likeness of God. And then my Bible came in and talked about God <clears throat> to gods. Now, I have to be very careful. I sent an email to Mike Bible. He's in Florida. And I said, Mike, I want you to know I'm having this Dr. Walton come in. And you might be interested because your view, Mike, of God might align somewhat with what he has to say. And so... I haven't heard back because I just sent him the email, but he'll probably call me and, and say, well, who is this guy? We talked about Hanukkah, right? The Hanukkah and the kenosis and Tommy. Christ means the Messiah. It's not his name. Christ is not his name. We hear Jesus Christ all the time. Christ is, Christ that, and Christ is the, oh, Christ is here. And Christ is not his name. It is his title, and that title is Messiah. He is the Messiah. So remember that as you hear this word, all, you always hear Jesus Christ, and Christ is coming back, and Christ is this. Remember that in Jesus' day, in, in the day that the New Testament was written, they didn't think of it as his name. They thought Jesus, the Messiah. Oh, the Messiah. Oh, oh, the Messiah. Especially to the Jews. So the reason that the reason Paul uses Jesus Christ so re unbelievably a lot is because he's conveying to everybody, Jew and Gentile, that this guy, Jesus, is the Messiah. He's the Messiah. He's the Christ. But we today, we forget that and we just think it it's his name. Don't do that. As Christians, do not do that. Remember, he's the Messiah. And his name is Jesus Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean, Tommy? God with us. God with us. So his name is Jesus Emmanuel, and he is God with us. And Walt is going to talk a little bit about that. You'll hear him talk about that, okay? So we end with this, uh, the, the main thing that you should know. Okay. Now you are going. You have a view on creation. Do you? Do you have a view on creation? Uh, does anyone want to tell me? Does anyone tell me when the Earth was made? Anybody want to throw something out there? March, eight, March 18th, my birthday, when I was born. That's when I was made. Oh, happy birthday. <laughs> Your birthday is the 18th? It is. Oh. Remember, you may have a view on creation, but just because you have a view, you only know what you've been taught. And if you haven't been taught anything else, you only know what you've received. So when you go to school, you learn some new things, and you might have to unlearn. Okay? So... Walton's going to come at you, and he's going to present something to you that you might have to unlearn something. And I'm going to show you what that is, okay? The creation debate, the universe beyond the world. Remember, the creation is not just about the Pacific Ocean and the planets 
the, 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 this little blue thing, it, it's not about that. Because when you look at this, and the earth is one little, one little speck, you can't even see it there, but God created all of this. Okay? Mm -hmm. And we think, oh, well, I'm only concerned that he created the world. <laughs> uh, hmm. He created everything. Things that the Hubble telescope can see even beyond the Hubble. So when you think about God's creation, don't limit yourself to the world. The world or the earth? <laughs> Good question. I'm, and, and I'll explain that in a minute. The world or the earth. Because, because be careful of your Bibles. Watch out. Be very careful. Because Bibles sometimes translate a particular Greek or Hebrew word as world, as earth, as ground, as region, as area. And they have different, different translations for that word that they've used to accommodate their interpretation. Never do a word study in a, never do a word study with a paraphrase. Got it? You don't do word studies with the NIV. You don't. It's a paraphrase. And even when you choose a literal translation, be very cautious because they too can have errors. One of the main ones is the King James Version, okay? And it, it's when they translate the end of the world, when the real world, the real word is the end of the age, not the world. So be careful, and I'll, I'll show you some of that. So created in the recent past is the Young Earth View. Very old work of art in a day-age view, restoring a historication of restoration view, a literary theme over literal chronology. And so Walton falls somewhat in this area. Because he's saying, what is the theme over the time? For him, he doesn't care about the time. This is irrelevant. Okay? And you'll find out. So he falls into this area. And you probably fall into this area. You probably fall in a young earth view that the world, that this earth was created eh, 2,500 years ago or maybe 3,000, well, somewhere in there, 2,000, 3,000, but certainly not millions, millions. Evolution, dinosaurs? Or, I don't know, it can't be that old. So it's okay to think about these. You can, so Janice, we can, we can think. It's okay to think about maybe I'm wrong on my view. Okay. On the other hand, maybe you're right. Maybe just thinking about it, you say, well, I, well I'm, I, I got that right. Okay. So, hey, Rick, do you know if he get, goes into um, the way if he touches on like the gap theory between the first and second verse? I'm going to touch on the gap theory. Okay. I'm going to get the gap theory. Okay, so here's something we're very interested. What is in blue is Bible. What is in Yellow is secular. Okay? So we have an undated creation narrative, undated Noah builds the ark, other ancient cultures also have flood stories. So the Sumeritans, the, 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 all these weird Yakinis, ancient, ancient groups, okay, they wrote too, just like Moses did. And so you have these competing texts out there. The Egyptians, about 2400, they imported gold from Africa. About 2300 BC, horses were domesticated in Egypt, chickens in Babylon, and bows and arrows were finally used in wars. They, they started figuring out how to do this stuff. 2300 BC, then in 2166, Abraham was born. Abraham, Abraham, 21. But Moses isn't born yet. Moses, who wrote, the, wrote Genesis, he's not, he's not even around. 2100 BC, glass. And the ziggurats um, uh, by Mesopotamia, um, and this is the Tower of Babel, okay, when the Tower of Babel was interest. And there are uh, other ancient, ancient texts that have stories like that in them as well. Alpha, alcohol was uh, used to alleviate pain in 21, so finally we get beer, <laughs> okay? Or alcohol, they, they figured it out, like, oh. Wow, whoa, whoa, I drink this and I become a whoa, whoa, whoa. So they, they learn that, okay? 21, 20, 91, Abraham entered Canaan. 
2066, Isaac is born. 2006, Jacob and, and Esau. 2000 BC, Native Americans immigrated to North America from North Asia. Stock breeding and irrigation was used in China. They started breeding animals. They started domesticating animals. Stonehenge uh, is dated around here. In England, for religious worshipers, they, they, they're, there's something about Stonehenge. Has anybody been to Stonehenge? Anybody, you guys know what it is, right? A bunch of rocks, and they, it lines up with the moon and the stars and stuff. Uh, in 1929 BC, Jacob fled to Haran. In 1915 BC, Joseph was born. In 1900, the Egyptians used irrigation to control the Nile. Right? Oh, oh. So there's other cultures going on besides the Jews who wrote the Bible. There's other, ah, there's pretty smart people. There's other smart people out there. In 1900, anybody know who Larry David? If you know who Larry David is? Have you seen the commercials where Larry David is advertising to buy uh, Bitcoin? Mm -hmm. And he's on, he, he, and, and he's in a thing, and a, and a guy says, I invented the wheel. Have you seen that commercial? Larry David goes through a bunch of historical events, and he says, they, don't believe them, don't believe them, don't believe them. And so this guy says, we want you to promote um, uh, Bitcoin. Bitcoin. And he said, ah, it'll never work. <laughs> but it's, it's, for his whole life, Larry David says, oh, the wheel will never work. And he's, he has one about the Constitution. He said, you're going to let people vote, even the stupid people? You're going to let stupid people? And Thomas Church says, yes! And, and Larry David tries to rip up the Constitution. So, have you seen it? Have you seen it? Okay. Okay. So, um, spoke wheel, horses started to pull carts. That was something new. 1885, Joseph rules Egypt. 1805 BC, Joseph dies. 1750, Babylon, mathematician, cube in the square root, and Hammurabi of Babylon invented the first legal code. So, we have legal law. This is how we run our society. It's not just a bunch of guys now running around beating each other up. They say, whoa, whoa we got a book. We're going to make some laws here. You know. And that was the first legal code. 1700 BC, Egyptian papyrus describes medical and surgical procedures. They started writing down, uh, we cut open an arm and there was something, there's something, a lug in there. We don't know what that is. Moses was born in 1526. 1500 BC, the Sun Valley of Egypt, and the Mexican Sun Pyramids are going. Get that? So there's, there's people on the other side of the world yet, right? And Columbus hasn't sailed across the ocean yet. <laughs> Let me say that again. <laughs> See? Columbus hasn't discovered America yet, but there's people already there, okay? I'm going to go through Genesis quickly so you can get a bite of it, okay? The purpose is to record God's creation, and, he, and then he follows it with stories. Moses' uh, stories of generation to generation. No, I got I spelled it wrong. Generation, I got, I got generation. <laughs> I messed up there. Uh, David is around, it's dated around 1450 to 410, 1410 B.C. It's dated around, we don't know exactly when. We, nobody knows when. You can talk to Dave. He knows, oh, you're going to write a paper? Well, a guy starts writing and it doesn't get published until a year, two years, maybe ten years later, okay? So, uh, Adam, the, the key people, these are just key people in Genesis, Adam and Eve, and sometimes, as Christians, you probably say, I can't keep all the people straight. I don't know if Jacob was Joshua's son, or, or they, then they got Ruth and Rebecca, and I, I, was she married? I, I, and sometimes the people can be overwhelming because you can't follow along. So I'm going to recommend a way for you to read Genesis. And it's, it's very easy. Okay? Topics of your creation, obviously sin, um, faith, and God always redeems. God always... <laughs> God always redeems. So, Rick, Rich, I, I, I hate Putin too. But evil always, always eventually consumes itself in time. Maybe, maybe he'll link up with China and they'll take over the world. Maybe. Okay. 
But eventually, that will break too, because evil always consumes itself. And God always redeems. So uh, uh, keep that in mind when you hear all this stuff, because uh, here we, we see it all the time. Okay? Okay. I'm going to go through the arrows with you really quick. First line of the Bible, in the beginning, the beginning of what? In the, be uh, the, the beginning of what? Time. Creation. <clears throat> beginning God of must have been there before there was time. Yeah. So God has always existed. So he's there. So in the beginning, well, we tend to think it's the world, right? That, that, that in the beginning, when God pushed this world together, right, in the beginning, that's what I my mind goes to because that's what I was taught as a kid. So when you're saying world, are you saying the earth, earth yeah, yeah. versus, right? Yeah, yeah. Because this, the world, I mean, it's not the universe. I mean, the universe existed right. before the world. But my teaching was well, the earth was made, the world was made, and so I only saw a little big ball. I didn't think about the universe. Okay, in the beginning, God created the earth because I see this. <laughs> oh, oh. Now, in your minds, you're you've got a mind. You you already in your mind. You have a conception of what you think heavens is. Incidentally, this is plural in the, in the but but in many Bibles it'll say uh, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, heaven and earth, and they take the plural out. But there are many levels of heaven. There, there's many different heavens, okay, because it's plural. But some Bible translations take the grammar out, and that's what Kathy's going to talk about. Yes, yeah, you're going to talk about it, this grammar and how this is done. Hey, okay. Rick, doesn't um the heavens and the earth in the Hebrew, the original Hebrew, is sky and land? Yes. Yes. So <laughs> we interpret it as the heavens, you know, the, the cloudy thing, you know. Excellent, Tommy. That's that's a really good insight. It's so really sky good. is right. just the sky. And so we'll, we'll start to dig that out because now you're starting to think, oh, wait a minute, the heavens and the earth. Now, if you ask a Jew... What the heaven and the earth is, what's he going to tell you, Dave? Temple. A Jew is going to say, hey, this is a temple. In the beginning, God created the temple. The way to relate to him. The heaven and the earth, the man on heaven and God in the temple, and it's a relationship. So, in the beginning, God created a way to communicate with God and man. Not the words heaven and earth. Now, so you probably think literal place of heaven, place of earth. A Jews think, oh, it's the temple where God meets. Okay? So start to think options for interpreting some of these words. Right? Right? There's different ways to look at heaven and earth. Don't just look at one. And Adam and Eve come along. Adam and Eve. Then there's Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel. And Adam's descendants. <laughs> Uh, then the Noah comes the flood, the republic, and the Tower of Babel. And here's uh, Michelangelo's The Deluge. And it's very interesting. I, I try to get as good a picture I can. But here is the ark, and the deluge, rain is coming down, and they're realizing, oh, we're doomed. We're doomed. Okay, just a, a picture of it, okay? Here we have a picture of Noah and the... the here we see the ark back here, and everybody's up here, all the animals getting ready to go, and getting ready, and, the, and then here we have Cain and Abel, okay, which is a wonderful story about blood, about blood, and there is a, that's a whole topic, I would like to see somebody talk about blood, that, that I would love to, a whole hour presentation on blood. I will, and that's not the first blood sacrifice. Yeah. Okay, so then 
go to the next. Then Abraham comes along. It's the story of Abraham. And God promises him a nation. <clears throat> you're going to have a kid. You're going to, you're going to have kids. And Abraham had a friend of Lot. Melchizedek, the king of Salem, blesses Abraham. And what's he do? Abraham says, gives him 10%. And that's where we get this concept of the tithe. You've heard, as Christians, you've heard this word tithe, right? Mm -hmm. Tithe, right? And I don't know if you're tithers or not. It's, it's, it's a way to look at things. Um, but that's where it comes from. God's coming. He promised a son to Abram. Notice, it, for Abram, it changed mm -hmm. his name from Abram to Abraham. Okay? And then we have the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham lied to Abimelech and said, no, 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 this is my sister. Right? Because he didn't want because apparently Abraham was pretty hot looking, right? So he didn't want, he lied to Abimelech, and Abimelech said, hey, hey, you don't lie to me. Then Ishmael was born of Hagar, and Ishmael becomes who? Who, who is Ishmael the descendants of? Anybody. The Arabs. The Arabs. The Muslims. Okay? The Arabs and the Muslims, okay? Because that wasn't God's plan. For, for for Abraham. Yeah, yeah. Because for Abraham, us, <clears throat> for our line. Yeah. So so we are suffering the consequences of Abraham's sin with Hagar. Mm -hmm. Right? Do you see that? Because yeah. he blessed Ishmael. Yeah. So he wasn't supposed to sleep with Hagar, but and, and Sarah wasn't supposed to give Hagar to him, but she did. Okay. And Isaac is finally born of Sarah. Abraham is obedience is tested because, as Don said. He went to Mount Moriah, <laughs> and he was going to sacrifice Isaac there, right? On the, on the top of the mountain there, Mount Moriah, okay? Um, Isaac and Rebekah, and then Abraham dies. That's a picture of Abraham uh, talking to the three angels. Then we get to Isaac. Here's where Isaac sells his birthright for a bowl of red soup. That's why his lineage is called Edom. Edom means red, and he, because he sold his birthright for a bowl of red soup of a royal stew. Um, Isaac also lied to Abimelech because he called Rebekah, who was not his wife, who was his wife, his sister. So like father, like son. Okay? Jacob was the younger and received Isaac's blessing, not Esau. Esau was the older. And Jacob was younger, and the, the blessing was supposed to go to the eldest, mm -hmm. which was Esau. Mm -hmm. But Jacob <laughs> stole it. Yep. Okay? Jacob was a shifty kind of guy. He has a dream. Uh, the dream, uh, again, you see the 10% of Jacob's ladder. And he was deceived by Laban. And he, he, he was supposed to get, he said to Laban, he said, I'll tell you what, I'll work for you 10 years. And then when that <laughs> period is up, I want that daughter of yours, that, that good-looking one. I want the good-looking one. I want the other one. Rachel, the younger one. Well, it comes down. He goes to the wedding. He's really happy. He lifts up the veil and says, you're not Rachel. You're Leah. Ugh. Right? So he, he goes back to uh, um, Laban and says, what, what did you do to me? And what does Laban say? According to our culture, we always marry up. According to our culture, according to our culture. So now you see where culture comes in, right? I, you know, of all the times that I've seen that, and this I don't know if there's a connection, but it just popped in my head. Was it Paul that, that warned us not to get hung up on, on customary? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Don't get the culture. Okay. Um, excuse me. It is our custom, right? So, of course, you get me. That's how we do it here. Uh, Jacob starts a family. He flees by the Levon. He sends his gift to Esau. His brother tries to mend the relationship. Okay? Now watch this. And Jacob has... This is a good slide. This is a good one. Because Jacob has 13 kids with four different women. Mm -hmm. Two of them were sisters. And Zilpah was Leah's maid. And Bilhah was Rachel's maid. Okay? And here are the numbers when the kids were born. Mm -hmm. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, uh oh Dan, and then Pauline to Bilhah, six, uh, 
uh, then Gad and the Alistair are eight. Then he goes back, and then he has this, uh, uh, then he's ten. Uh, Ladina, oh, and this is a female, okay? Mm -hmm. And finally, Joseph is born of Rachel, okay? And Benjamin is born. And then that's it. So he has 13 children, one daughter, mm -hmm. okay? These become the tribes of Israel. The 12 tribes of Israel. They become the 12 tribes of Israel. And we, we talked about that when we covered Judaism. Remember, we talked about the 12 tribes, okay? Do you know how many descendants um, Esau had at that time? 81. Really? To the 13. Mm -hmm. Really? Mm -hmm. um, then Jacob exacted uh, revenge against Shechem for raping of Dina, his sister in Shechem. Uh, they, he, he actually loved Dina, but um, Jacob thought that he had raped Dina. And, I, and you heard a sermon on this, it's usually like, she might have raped, or that he loved the guy too. So it, it was a big mess, okay? And the descendants of Esau are who? The Edomites. Mm -hmm. okay? And they're the ones promised dominion on the earth. Yep. Then we get to Joseph, and we're almost done with all of Genesis. We're almost done. Joseph has a dream of, grain, of grains, and he's the big grain, and then his brothers are the little grains, and his brothers really take off because who does he think he is? He's the youngest brother. He's, he's young. He's, he's not old like us. He's young, and he thinks he's going to be in charge of us. Not going to happen. So his brothers hated him. There's a good word there, Joseph. Joseph sold into slavery by his brothers. Judah and Tamar and Onan, okay? Um, Judah was supposed to have uh, relations with, with um, Tamar, except when he was having sex with her, he would pull out and his semen would go in the ground. And he wasn't supposed to do that. And so this is a pretty interesting story to read that. <clears throat> Joseph in Potiphar's house, he, he goes, he, he starts to live with Potiphar, and his wife accuses him of having of raping her, okay? So he ends up in prison. He interprets two of Pharaoh's dreams. He's made a ruler of Egypt. His brothers go to Egypt to get the grain, and they see that that's our brother. We thought he was. <laughs> that's our brother is a ruler of Egypt. And finally, his brothers go back and bring Jacob, <laughs> Joseph's father, brings him to Egypt. He says, "You're not going to believe what happened to our youngest brother. He's the king of Egypt. He's unbelievable." And Jacob died at 147, and Joseph died at 110. And they both died in Egypt, but, Je Jacob, but Joseph's bones are taken out of Egypt when Moses leaves for the Exodus. When Moses leaves, they take Joseph's bones. But it's not recorded that they took Jacob's bones. That's not recorded. But they may have because they may have been buried in the same ossuary. It could have been in the same place. Okay. Rick, let me ask, in defense of my wife, she has been working on Cain and Abel. We've been doing a lot of research. And to my discovery of this whole process, that Joseph, when he was taken out of the well and sold <coughs> to this tribe of, of people, they were descendants of Cain. Oh, really? Oh, my. Say that, oh, say that again. That's Adam. awesome. It is. Can you say that again, please? Um, when Joseph was sold oh. into slavery by his brothers, mm -hmm. they, they wanted the cash, and a group went by, and so they sold him. Mm -hmm. And you trace the history back, and they are descendants of Cain. Oh. So the Cain and Abel. These people here, John is saying, are descendants of Cain. They're taking, they're taking Joseph away, and there's his brother, they sold him in to slavery, and they're taking him away now. Mm -hmm. And you're saying these people are descendants of Cain. Mm -hmm. you, when you pull Cain and Abel apart, you, obviously Abel died, but Cain was marked right. physically as well as others. But how his descendants then go through life, the Bible, how the, this Cain and Abel never stops. Never stops. Never stops. How did you figure that out? Oh, it was reading. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, we'll present it. All right, cool. I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> they're... they're the point is, I'm going to recommend for you a, a way to read Genesis. Read it in sections. 
read just a Noah experience. Read, and so what I have up here, if you just want to read about Joseph, read 37 to 50. That's it. Don't look at Genesis, I've got to read the whole thing. No, take it in bites, because Moses likely wrote it in bites. You know, I got to, what's this? Because remember, Moses wasn't born until 1500s. Well, this stuff all happened way before that, okay? So read it in bites. Don't try to say, I've got to read the whole thing, because really, the stories are separate. So you can go and, and just, your Bible will probably tell you, this is the story of Noah, this is the story of Joseph. And read it that way. Read, just read that from 32 to 14 or whatever, okay? All right. Okay, so now you've just been through Genesis. But we're only concerned with the first part, creation. But you have Genesis now, okay? That's Walton. These are his two books. Lost World Genesis 1, Ancient Cosmology, and the Origins Debate. It's not going to be an easy night when he shows up. It's, it's not going to be easy. Okay? It's going to be hard. It's going to be thick. And his other one is the lost world of Adam and Eve, the Genesis, and the human origins debate. So I asked him, I said, um, Dr. Walton, you have these two books, which I know you're famous for. Right? I said, but what are you working on? He said, Rick, he said, what I'm really working on is how to interpret the Old Testament. He says, so if you'd like to have me come back, I'll cover this because I, I, this is what I'm known for, okay? And I present it all over the world, this, these two books. I, I, everybody calls me. He said, but for my next project, I've got a book coming up by IVP on how to interpret the Old Testament. And so we'll, I'm going to talk to him about it. And if you guys like Walt and his presentation style, we'll have him back again, okay? We'll have him back again. So that's his book. So now let's get into a, a little bit of where he's coming from. So you know when he gets here, eh, I don't like what he has to say. Because I'm, I'm going to show you now some of the stuff he's going to come with. Okay. The Lost World of Genesis 1, Ancient Cosmology, the, the first book, this is his first one, and it's just on Genesis 1. That's it. It doesn't go to Genesis 2 and 3 because Genesis 2 and 3 is about Adam and Eve. Genesis 1 is not about Adam and Eve, so he doesn't get into it. And he talks about what is this, what is this stuff created for, okay? Two words that you should know when he gets here. You should know what ontology is and what teleology is. Ontology is a study of what it means for X to exist. Ontology, ontology is what, what does it mean for this, for this book to exist? That's ontology. What does it mean for Dave to exist? What does it mean for the what what ontology? On. Think about on. Okay? Now you have to know that word because it's very significant to his theology. The other word to know is teleology. It's a study of meaning and purpose. He doesn't care about the ontology. He's concerned with what is the meaning and purpose of the creation. Ontology is concerned about what and when. What was created and when was it created? That's ontology of the world, right? So I think, in my mind, when I was born, oh, oh Rick, with a, the world was created about 2,800 B.C. And, uh, and, and the God came down and created the world, and, then, and that's what it was. And then, then later on, Adam and Eve, and, and it, it took some time, and then here we are. Okay, now go away and get confirmed. Right. <laughs> Teleology is about why now. Okay, so remember these two. These, these, are, these are paramount in Walton's theology, which he's going to come at. Which one do you think he's going to focus on? Teleology. Teleology. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Because he doesn't care what's here. He cares what are you doing with what's here. Okay? He doesn't care about, I, I'm putting words in his mouth, and he'll probably not say that. But he doesn't care about what was created or when it was created. For him, 
What are you doing with what was created? What's the purpose? What are you doing? Why and how? That's what he's concerned with. So what are you doing with what was created? Don't argue about, oh, well, there's the dinosaurs in 2000 shows, shows there's evolution. He will not argue evolution with you. He doesn't care. But he's concerned about, what are you doing with that, Wilson? What, what are you doing with the creation? As What are we doing with that? Ancient creation texts, in addition to the Bible, he'll come and he'll, he'll tell you some of those. I don't think he's going to get deeply into it. And there, so the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Sumerians, these are different people who wrote different things, okay? <coughs> people in the ancient Near East did not think, sorry, sorry, think, of creation in terms of making material things. Instead, everything is function oriented. That's in page 23 of this book. Okay? Now, he's saying, now remember, you can't go into the, the mindset of we're thinking what it is. We have to get out of thinking what Janice thinks about creation. What do you think about creation? We have to go back and think, what did those people think at that time? Remember, the Bible was not written to us. It was written for us. It was written to them. So you have to take your body and mind out of your Lamont, March 16, 2022, and you got to go back in time. Because he's saying those people were thinking about function, how do things work. Remember this, ontology is what and when stuff. Theology, teleology is why and how stuff. And function, he's going to focus on two things. And here is his, here's his two books. This is his first book. This is the second book. He's going to tell you what are we supposed to do, and he's going to show you how Adam and Eve were created to make order out of what we have been given. You going to work today, Dave? Did you make order? Did you get some things straightened out? Okay. So we are humans, and we're supposed to be making order out of this creation that was a mess. Because when it was created, it was void and formless. With nothing here, nothing worked. And God created a function for us to make this world work. Got it? So, Don, do you go to work today? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Wilson, so, you? And so many people don't understand it. I did. I tell them, I said, my, my job is a man, make order out of chaos. <laughs> make order out of chaos. And that's what, and, and <laughs> actually, when he gets to here, he starts dividing, he starts defining. What's the serpent? And you'll be surprised. He's not, he's not down on the serpent. He, he doesn't look at the serpent as that bad of a character. Because all he, he did is created doubt. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't the evil. He was just the catalyst. And you'll see how he, he comes to this, right? So I like how he looks at the, the serpent. He didn't have a problem with it. He, he just did what he does, right? Okay, now you got function or order? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oops. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form, void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Thus, nothing's working. Nothing is working in the world. Nothing is working. The world is formless. It's void. And he'll get into uh, explain the Hebrew word for those, the Hebrew words. Of, and I'm not going to do that. Okay, I'll let him do that. Okay? But when it created, it, it was nothing. Bill Gates would not have survived. <laughs> or Steve Jobs or Elon Musk. Right? Because... It was formless. And what he created was a way to make it work. And that's what Walton says. He says, I don't care about the stuff. What are we supposed to do with the stuff? So he claims the six days of the six days 
And you can get in your Bibles and you can look at the six days. You can look at the six days. But basically he says they're broken down into two. These are the functions. These are what work. These are what are, are done. And these are things that are supposed to do it. So he breaks uh, these down. Day one, time and season, summer, winter, and there's light. Because there's light, and that means there's darkness. And so there's two separate things now. Okay. Then he says, day two, weather, cold, hot, space, and sky. Okay. Day three, food, seed, harvest. All right. These are the functions. These are what work. These are what's supposed to make it work. Okay. So he has a sun, the moon, and stars, the separate days and nights. So we look at the moon the other night. Donna said, look at that moon. I couldn't see it. It was, it was she could see it. And I, I couldn't see it for some reason. But that moon, eventually, it had a light to it, right? So that told me there's a moon. Darkness is coming. The, the night's, the night's going to get here. Okay? And so here we, we got some time. And then he had the functionaries. Notice that fish, their role of a fish, what is their role? They swim. They do not fly. That's their role. They're fulfilling their role. That's their function. That's what they're supposed to do. And the animals, what are animals supposed to do? Well, we're supposed to multiply and make things good. That's our job. And that's what he's going he's gonna to focus on. He doesn't care about when. He doesn't care about how. He's concerned about what works. That's his theology. That's what you're going to hear. Okay? Because in Near Eastern thought, their view was people serve God. we got to serve God. But in the Hebrew mindset, when Moses and they're writing these books, no, 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 Our creation is different. Our creation, God serves us. God gives us this earth. He gives us this garden. Oh, my word, it must have been beautiful. God gave the garden. Beautiful. He gave the garden all this stuff to Adam and Eve to do what? To work the garden. So Adam and Eve's call, what's it called? They're supposed to work the garden. What are they supposed to? They're supposed to fulfill their function. That's, that's, that's why God made them. And God not only made the garden for them, he gave them all this stuff here. Hey, I'll give you a cow. I'll give you a bird. I mean, there's trees over there. You, you can invent iron. I, I, eventually you'll figure out atoms and particles of and you'll send a guy to the moon, and you don't even know what the moon is yet. You can't battle yet, Adam. But I give you all the stuff. So the purpose here is that Genesis thought God serves people, but in the others, easier, uh -uh, people serve God. It's a huge difference. You see the difference? Yeah. Huge, huge, big. And the Sabbath day. Now we come to day seven. <laughs> What is the Sabbath? Well, God rests in the temple. Where's the temple? Here on earth. God is resting here. And that's why this Jesus Emmanuel, God with us, this is big. Jesus Emmanuel, God with us, he is still resting with us. He rests with us on the Sabbath. And this is, this is the place where God rests. And it means, basically, when you rest on the Sabbath, you disengage. You, you don't do what you do during the week. Okay? I try not to. We, Don and I, we try, on, when a Sunday rolls around, or someday, sometimes a Saturday rolls around, we intentionally think, I'm disengaging. I'm disengaging when I'm, from what I'm supposed to do. Now, sometimes I'll, I will engage and say, oh, I, I got this project coming. And I don't, I don't make it a law. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And you engage without obstacles. Okay, so I'm, I, I don't want anything in my way today. Uh, I'll make chicken Saturday, and that way uh, Sunday I have to cook. Right? I want to disengage from cooking, so I'm going to cook on Saturday and have that meal on Sunday. And it's really nice because I don't have to cook on Sunday. Okay, and. Holy, it's set aside, it's separate, it's a separate day. It's something different. Remember we talked about holiness? 
Holiness is not some guy with a robe and a hat and fancy canes and a big robe. That's not a holy guy. Holiness is somebody set aside, something set aside for something special. And the world is a place for God's presence. God is here. Okay? So he, he rests here. He likes that. Okay? He's not someplace out there. Um, these remain in the poor Sabbath keeping for the people of God, for he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his, from Hebrews. Okay? So, enjoy your Sabbath. I don't care if you take it Saturday or Sunday, or, but if you're doing six days a week, you need a rest. You're de not designed to go 24 7, 34 weeks. You're not designed that way. You'll, you'll die. You will die because you're not designed that way. God wants you to take a rest. Now, I sometimes, I, sometimes for me, and Donna too, I suppose, sometimes going to church on Sunday is at work. Sometimes it, it, it's, uh, uh. now when I was playing in the, when I'm playing a lot of worship bands, Man, I was at that church at 5 o'clock and 6 o'clock in the morning rehearsing, and then I was there Wednesday nights, and then we're there Thursday night, and then I'm there for, for four services, and then I get out at noon, and then I got to put all the equipment. Church for me was a work, really. It was tough, right? And, of course, I listened to the sermon, and, I, and it was fine, but it became something that I was like, uh, this is a, this is what I... I don't like playing in the worship band. I like to play in the worship band, but I noticed that I needed to rest too from that. See? Did you play in a worship band, Ryan? Did you? Yep. Oh, yeah. Bunch of them. So on Sunday, you're. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's exactly right. Okay. Now, caution. Caution. Check your Bibles. Here's where I'm. As soon as I'm going to explain this to you. This, in the beginning, the world, Earth, there's a. All these different words, the universe, world, earth, the land, the region, the empire, there's area, there's a Roman conquest. What are they talking about when you hear these words? When you see these in the Bible, be very careful because you have to go to the Greek to find out. An example, there are, here's just four Greek words. Aeonas comes from Hebrews 1, 2. It means universe, but not the world. It's not talking about the world. It's talking about everything. Or sometimes we just talk about the world. Well, are we talking about the world or are we talking about the land on the world? We're not talking about the sea. We're talking about the land. And then when we talk about the land, are we talking about Illinois or the United States? Oh, well, well are we talking about Illinois or Lamont? How big is that land? Right? And so you have to be really careful how you interpret these words. And it requires, you should have a reference to go with. So, Aeonas, Cosmos, it's spelled with a C, but sometimes you see it's your K, and it means the world, or earth, or creation, I don't know. You gotta look at that word and figure it out. It's not easy. And then, Greek, oikomen, this is where we get oiko, oikonomy, economy, economy, that means the world, earth, region, or the economy of the Roman Empire. It was the, the system of the Roman Empire, how they ruled. Or maybe it was the system of how the Jews ruled. Or maybe it was the system of how the Chinese ruled. Right? And then the word gay, which just means land. It means land. Area of region, not the world or the earth. And you have to, sometimes, Bibles will translate that world or earth. When it's not world or earth, it is land. Okay? So... Be cautious when you come across those words. All right? Heavens and earth. Heaven or heavens, you'll see it plural. You'll see it, see it singular. Earth or land, I talked about. Uh, the context, did the text convey a physical to its audience, or did the context convey figurative? So we're, when they read that in their days, did they think they were talking physical? Walton says no. They weren't thinking physical. Why? They couldn't see past the earth. They didn't even know the earth was round. They had no idea the earth was round. So they, they, they were not thinking about, oh, the creation of this planet that we're on. 
They didn't even know what a planet was, right? So he said, no, no, no. Their mind, the ancient mind, was thinking, ah, I got this stuff, right? I got to do something. Their mind was not thinking like our mind is, because we can see that we, we saw the guy walking on the moon and he took a picture of the earth, and we said, whoa, that was cool, right? And now we see the universe. So we see more, we know more, but Columbus hadn't even sailed the ocean blue. For those people, they, they didn't know, okay? So the Bible's written to, them for us, written to them for us in dealing with any cultural language and literary devices. So Walton is coming in, and when Kathy comes in and she talks about this, we'll see how literary devices, when you read the Bible, how that, how that works, okay? Here's your seven days. So what? Cosmic Temple inauguration, not concerned with material. Walton doesn't care about the material stuff. Grammar matters. <clears throat> Young Earth, Old Earth, Gap Theory, Gap Theory. Do you know what Gap Theory is? Go Gap ahead. Theory. So uh, between Genesis 1-1 and one, Genesis 1-2, you'll see in your Bible, most likely you'll see in your Bible it says, and the, and the earth was formless and void. The actual Hebrew word is not the word for was, it's the word became. So the concept is that the earth was in a particular state, and then it, it's someplace in there, Satan, that's when Satan fell, and the earth became formless or chaotic, and then that's where the theory comes. That's, that, at least my understanding is that's what the theory is. That's a theory. It's a dispensational theory, okay? It's a theory. It's a theory, and so it's, it's, it's a possibility. It's a way to look at it, okay? And so are you guys a young earth? It's all only about material stuff. Are you that? Are you an old earth? That one day is not 24 hours. It could have been millions of years. One day. Right? Or are you a gap theory guy? And the gap theory millions or billions or trillions more years? Okay. And when and what does it matter? Why and how matters? Function. That's what, that's what <clears throat> Walton is going to come with you. He's going to come at you and say, I want you to start thinking. For, forget the creation of stuff. Nobody cares about the creation of stuff. What are you doing with what God has given? That's what I that's what Walton's gonna push. Okay. So again, a higher priority. He's gonna tell you that purpose, the purpose of theology is why and how versus ontology, cause, what and when. He falls in this camp. Now it's important. Yeah, we like to talk about, yeah, well. This stuff was made. It's cool. Let's talk about when do you think was made, Dave? <laughs> Nobody has a clue. So Walton says, why argue about it? Why argue evolution or or Big Bang theory? Why? It doesn't make any sense. It was worthless. Right. Because your purpose as a human is what? Function. Purpose is to do things, okay? And purpose theology, higher priority. So he's saying that this theology is higher than this. There's nothing wrong with ontology. There's nothing wrong with, I think it was 2800, eh, about 4000 BC. That's what I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah the guy went poof. And, uh, I'll give 4,000. 10,000 years, I'm going with, I could do 50,000 years. You know, a million works for me. I don't care. Now that's what Walton is going to come. Okay, um, God made material to be employed, work productive. So it's what are you doing with what God has created? So think of it like a house. A house you have to maintain. Material, physical, external. When you work on your house, you improve stuff. You fix the roof, the sink, the toilet, the garages. Your house, your house is physical, but your home. You're a home. That you have to sustain. You have to sustain a home. It has to function. It has to work operationally, internal. When you work on your home, you improve the function, the order, the love, the purpose, the benefits, the familial places, the holy places. You're concerned with making a home. I work a lot on I, I work a lot on my house. Man, I worked on it today. You know, a lot working on a house. You guys work on your houses? 
You got junk? You take care of it? Okay. But a house, that's sustenance. So you want to sustain. In addition, you have to maintain. You have to maintain the stuff. But you're, you're really sustaining. Okay. So here's the summary of is the lost world of, of, of Genesis 1. Material stuff preceded seven days. So it kind of falls with what you just said. Material stuff preceded the seven days. It was here already. So I, in some ways, I don't have a problem with this gap theory when you, the way you bring it up. Not totally involved yet, but I, I can see a little bit. Okay. And I just want to be clear, I'm not even saying that I buy into the gap yeah. theory. I, I just looked at, I researched it, it It's a just bit. a theory. It's just a theory. <clears throat> so he's saying material stuff, function, trumps material, cosmic temple inauguration, that God inaugurated. Okay, here's what I'm, I created this. And why did I do that? Because I want people to worship me. I want them to understand that I provide for them. I want them to understand that I got their backs. Their I, I don't like, I'll ask for is a little, would you glorify me a little bit? I gave you a new car. Oh, you're going to complain because it was red and you wanted blue. <laughs> right? So he's looking for teleology, the meaning of why and how trumps ontology, what and when. Get busy employing God's stuff for his glory. That's the lesson that Walton will say to you. What are you doing? Get busy functioning for who? For God's glory. So he gives you certain things. Now, it, uh, do you, you're at the hospital or you're at the medical clinic or something. Well, D is not, um, D is not fixing Illinois toll roads. Okay? That's not her function. That's your function. And don't mess with trying to do her function. That's not what I called you to do. Okay? And you find out what you're supposed to do, right? And you, uh, you're supposed to be a printer, Dave. That's, that's what you're called. You, you messed around with, with, with uh, at Purdue. I don't know what you were doing there, Dave. Okay? I don't know. It's some kind of investing or what. But you're supposed to be a printer. That's what you, that is how you're wired, man. Okay? So get busy employing God's stuff. Then we go into Adam and Eve. Got it? This one's put over here. And now we go into this one. Here is what he's going to tell you about Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve is really cool. He, he gives it that. Is he going to bring some of those that we can buy? The book? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if he will or not. I don't know if he will. Um, but but I, you, can, you can borrow these if you want. Okay. You can pay that. Um, okay. Whereas Genesis 1 is about function, theology, and purpose. That's what his first book is. His second book is about order. Not concerned about the creation stuff. He doesn't care about it. He's not. I'm done with Genesis 1. I don't care about the creation. Now I'm going to teach you what it is about Adam and Eve. Okay? Um, not concerned with what or when was created. And his concern is what is bringing order to the stuff. Okay? What is bringing order to the stuff? Everything brings order to the stuff. Birds have their order. Ducks Whales, animals have their purpose, their function, and they have their place in doing their thing. Why does a lion uh, attack you? That's how we was created, idiot. Don't expect he's going to be nice to you. You know, you go ahead and try to keep an alligator in your home. See how that works out for you. Okay? They have their functions. Okay? So God says his good statements. His good statements. Good God's creation is function as design. He says it is good. Function is good. Working the way God intended. It's pleasing to God. It's beneficial to his creation. So when you are in your function, not only is it pleasing to God, it pleases me. Thank you for teaching that toll way. I appreciate that. I like, I like going through that thing where I don't have to throw the change in any which kind of things. Maybe it costs me a little bit more. You, you charge me too much for that. But... <laughs> You're fulfilling, <laughs> you know, people. you're fulfilling your function, okay? Now, he said something something that is not good, comes from Genesis 2.8, it's not good for man to be alone. Hurry up, you two. <laughs> it's not good, 
it is just not good for man to be alone. It's not bad. It's not bad, but it's not good. Okay. Now some of us are alone. Some of us are alone. And when you were with somebody, it was good. But now you have to deal with. And now you, you have to deal with. It. But it's always there. You can always link up with other people. So you're always designed to function in what? Relationship. So it doesn't make any difference if it's male or female. You fulfill your function in your job in working with other people. When he said it's not good for many men, certainly he wanted a male-female relationship. But what he's saying is that no man is an island. You don't, you can't. Okay. Hey Rick, can I say just real quick? And this is just a little bit off topic, but um, historically, most Jewish weddings took place on Tuesdays because in the like in the creation week, the Sabbath being Saturday, that's day seven. So Tuesday is day three, and it's the only day in the creation account where God uses the phrase, it is good twice. So they would always get married on a Tuesday because that was like good. a double that's blessing. Cool. Hey, where did you learn that? I just, I like studying. So. You know, we got to change our wedding day now. <laughs> 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 and then something is very good, and God saw that everything he had made and this is the only place. It's very good. Very good. His creation, he's telling you, is very good. <clears throat> there's good. There's not good. And then there's very good. Okay? So, he breaks down his time, day one, day two, time and space and order, first three. And then the second, four, five, and six, functionaries and the purpose and the image of God. So that's how he looks at his days of creation. Then we get into Adam and Eve, and now it gets cool. Adam is a Hebrew for human. It doesn't mean man. It means humans, which we're all. So you are a man, and you are a woman. So you're just as much as a man as he is. You are a woman. And, and I'm going to, when he comes, I'm going to ask him. I want him to expand on how he viewed the rib. He says in, in his book, he said, yeah, the, the, the woman didn't come from the rib. It was a much deeper thing that Adam went through and that his whole body was reformed. And so you, you have to read his book. But he's saying, don't think that he just took a little rib out and created the woman. No, 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 not at all. There was a, much deeper than that. So, um, there was no Hebrew language when Adam and Eve were created. Remember that. There was no language for that. Genesis 1, how sacred space functions for humans. Genesis 2 3, about how humans function sacred. Now notice, this is the sacred space, how it functions. For, how, here, here, here's how it works. And this is, here's how you're supposed to do it. Genesis 1, here's the stuff, you guys. Genesis 2 and 3, here's what you're supposed to be doing. That's pretty cool. That is, that's why he's a scholar. That's, that's very insightful, right? He's a smart guy. Here's the stuff. Now here's what you're supposed to do with it. Okay? Adam and Eve should first be archetypical. That means they're archetype for us. So, uh, Willard, you are Adam. Dee, you are Eve. You, we're, we are Adam and Eve. We, you're just as bad. You didn't prompt. I know Rich would eat the fruit. Faster, you know, right away. So we're just like them. Um, to have been created to us, humans were always born. So remember we talked about mortality of the soul? Mm -hmm. So Walton will come and say, and you can say, yeah, we, we learned about that, okay? Walton will say, we were always mortal. We were never created immortal. We're always intended to die, okay? Um, uh, Eve, perhaps not just from rib, half, she comes from half of Adam, a whole half of him. Okay, and he'll talk about that. I'm going to try to get him to expand on that. Um, and they say when um, when a man and a woman become one flesh, 
they get as close as they possibly can to being what they were first created as equals. So when you are in relationship sexually, you are at the closest point you can be to the created getting back to what you were intended to be. That is, that is why sex is so important in marriage and why sex outside of marriage is so destructive because it just wasn't designed that way. So he's saying this one flesh thing is a, a way that they can return to their original state. And New Testament, you Adam and Eve as archetypes, and we are them. The New Testament, Paul says, yeah, we're, we're just like Adam and Eve, so no difference. Rick, can you go back? So Walton's going to say that um, we're mortal, we were, Adam and Eve were always mortal. Sin, the sin that came in was death. It wasn't death. We were always born to die, right? Yeah. Okay. That's what he's going to, and ask him about that. Okay, explain that to me, right? And he'll, he will. Um, okay, now here's Adam and Eve, God dwelling in Eve in the garden, Adam and Eve, tend the garden, serve, they, they, were, they were to function, take care of the garden. So what's that tell you? Weeds are growing, right? Yep. Okay, there, so we think that, oh, it was so perfect. No, Adam had to get his lawnmower started too, right? He had, uh, yeah. He had to no, tend the garden. He had to to eat the grass. <laughs> he had to tend it. He had to do something, right? He didn't sit back there and say, oh, cool, this is nice. Right? He had to tend it, okay? He was a priest in a sacred place, so we get this priest thing. Eve helps Adam. Eve is designed specifically to help him. Her function is every bit as important as Adam's. Every bit as important, okay? And serving was their function, which means genetics are irrelevant to the function. Genetics, your genetic makeup is, nobody cares about your genetic makeup because you are to function with what you have. Uh, he didn't give me, I'm, I'm, I, I wish I could play like Eric Clapton. I can't play guitar like Eric Clapton. I'd like to be able to, you know, it'd be nice if I could play baseball like Brian Sandberg. That'd been nice. But I didn't get those genes. I didn't get the genes. I didn't. I'd been nice to be Muhammad Ali to have those quick. I mean, that's my head, that. But I didn't get those genes. So I'm supposed to function with what I got. <laughs> and even my mistake. You're that is a sense of what you can do, but that's really also affecting people born without a limb, born with a disability. They have a purpose. They have a function. They have a function. Regardless yep. of the yep. degree. It's not a curse. Yes. And the tree thing. Now, listen, he talks about that. Now, the tree gets pretty cool, right? Because you have two trees in the garden, right? Mm -hmm. There's two of them there. And he talks about that. In the Garden of Eden, the, the center of order, there were two trees in the garden, okay? There were two trees there. The tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil, okay? So they had the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Well, if they ate of the tree of life after they ate of the good and evil, what would they continue on? God threw them out of the garden because they ate of the tree of knowledge, and he had to throw them up before they ate of the tree of life. So he threw them out of the garden before they ate of that other tree. He told them not to eat of the tree of wisdom, knowledge of wisdom. He said, don't eat that one. But when he ate of it, he threw them out of the garden because he didn't want them getting the tree of life. Right? Uh, Gilgamesh, an epic, uh, Atlanta Dillman, as a place of cultic purity. It has a similar view of this garden. It's pure. It's clean. So here's another ancient text that writes about a, a garden, a, a pure, perfect, perfect thing, okay? So remember, Genesis isn't the only, the only book talking about purity stuff, right? The Tale of Napa, he'll talk about that, offered food for life, the trees of the garden. So this, this epic tale, 
talks about food for life and eating of the tree, right? And so here's another, another motif, another writing from a completely different culture, which has a eating, eating of fruit, the fruit, right? And the cosmic tree of Uridi, a Neo-Assyrian text, uh, Giskin is a cosmic tree. It has a cosmic tree. And so what, what Walden has done, he studied all of these ancient texts, and he's found out that there are similarities in those texts that are in our Bible. So Moses, is, uh, Moses did not write alone. So Adam and Eve, they, they were allowed to eat from the tree of knowledge, right? And then they were kicked out of the garden because they didn't want to have eat from the tree of life. Well, that's, that's what some people say. That's, okay. that's a theory. That's a theory, right? But, but had they continued to live in the garden and according to the structure that God intended, yeah. you would never have had to enter that evil world. Okay. So there's a, a food motive in it. When I, I'm really looking forward, and he said this, he said the, the Genesis 1 is cool, but people want to know about Adam and Eve. That's the one there. So I'm, I will, when I moderate him, I'm going to hurry him up through the function part because I want him to get to Adam and Eve because he said that's the one that people really like because I talk about the serpent and stuff. The problem with the tree God offers life to wisdom, only available through relationship. Adam and Eve tried to seize the wisdom on their own terms, mm -hmm. outside of relationship. Mm -hmm. they, they, wanted to, they wanted that wisdom on my terms. But God said, no, I created you for function. Don, did you finish the interstate in one day? No, you did not. Did you, can you get all your work done in one day? No, you can't. It's a process. But Adam and Eve wanted it. I'll be thinking right now. And God said, no, you, you, do you not get it? I put you in the garden to tend the garden repeatedly. Repeat, and it's going to keep breaking down. And you're going to keep, that's what I want you to do. That's your function. Okay? So they tried to get on their own terms and outside of relationship. They wanted to be outside of relationship. Okay? And he has a good one on sermon. I found this picture. I thought it was pretty cool. Because here's Adam and Eve, and here is the serpent. Mm -hmm. What do you see? You don't see a snake, do you? No, no. but that was the first. That was what happened. That happened After. afterwards. Yep. So when you see a picture in the garden of a snake, right? Of a snake. Mm -hmm. eh, that's, that's wrong. It's wrong theology. It's wrong Bible. It's no, 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 no. This kind of explains it better. Because here we see this creature convincing them to do this. And notice the arms and the legs and the webbed feet and the tail. But a snake doesn't have any of that. So after this happened, what did the Lord do? He took, that, took the legs away from the serpent. The consequences for him. And I asked him, I asked him often about that. It'll be cool. Then Adam and Eve chose to make themselves the center of the world, source of wisdom. We are Adam and Eve. We, want the, we do the same thing. We want wisdom without waiting for it. How come I can't do this? Well, no. How come learning takes so long? I mean, I'm, I'm 70 years old. 69, 70. And I, I'm still learning. Gee, I am so sick of learning. It's taken a long time to learn. Okay. Um, so they, Adam and Eve, admitted, let disorder, disorder come into the cosmos. And hamartiology is the study of? Sin. Hamartiology is the study of? Sin. 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 Pornarology? Evil. Evil. Okay. And wisdom is the core of order. So wisdom is at the center. We're always supposed to seek wisdom, seek wisdom. And I get so tired of seeking wisdom. You guys don't want to be here tonight, do you? Uh -huh. I couldn't wait to get here. <laughs> <laughs> this is hard, right? I mean, I'd rather be home watching 
I don't know why. Yeah. Rick, speak for yourself. We'd rather be here listening uh, to you. What I'm, what I'm saying is that wisdom is tough. You have to work at it. To, you, to get this, you have to work at it. Okay? Um, and it's a process. It doesn't happen all at once. The process. Okay? But Adam and Eve, what they do? They took a shortcut. And it didn't work. Okay? <laughs> so remember. I've taken shortcuts too. <laughs> And what we go back to the beginning that <laughs> every time we get the shortcut. Walter makes the point that being saved to something is better than being saved from something. Oh, wow. That's heavy. That's Man. chew on that. Chew on that. Being saved to something is a lot better than being saved from something. Well, I don't want to go to hell. No, I want to go to heaven. Big difference. Yeah. Big difference. Uh, you, you don't want to avoid hell. No, you want to go after the heaven. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of him. He's an old-timey pastor, and he passed away decades ago. Paris Reedhead. His most famous sermon is called Ten Shekels and a Shirt, and it's on YouTube if you get a chance. I listen, I've listened to it repeatedly over the last five years. It's amazing. He says something very similar towards the end of the sermon. He said... Even if Jesus did not come to save us from going to hell, he still deserves our worship because of who he is. That Ooh, in and of good. itself, mm -hmm. it, that he is like his his glory and his all of that is worthy of our worship. Mm -hmm. Even if even if we did not receive that benefit, that we should still worship him because of who he is. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good. Okay, so it's one of my favorite sermons. I love it. Walton is going to get into defining order and non-order and disorder. He says we currently live in a world of these three. There is non-order, and that's natural confusion, and we process towards order. There's order, the pursuit of function, and there is disorder, the result of evil is in a consequence. All are subject to sin and death because of disorder, not genetics. It has nothing to do with genetics. Okay? So what he's saying, sin came into the world when accountability came into the world. If there wasn't accountability, sin to your heart's content. Like what difference does it make? Right? And that's the problem with some human beings. They think they're not subject to the accountability of God. They, th like Putin. Putin, he thinks he's not subject to the accountability. Oh, no. Same for Biden. Same for Trump. Oh, you too. Including Nancy. Including Nancy. <laughs> so, sin is the point of accountability when accountability came to so when accountability came in the world everything changed okay. Walter's image, image of God in humans are to function where are supposed to be like God because what did God do he functioned in creating the world he worked to create the world he functioned he did his thing he did what God is supposed to do create what are you supposed to do? Same thing. You're supposed to create things. Fix things. Did you make anything when you work for the oh, interstate? Do you, you make things? you create things that weren't there before? It's fulfilling your function. Right? Did you create something today, Rich? Did you create or did you work? Did you do something work-wise? Yeah. You're right. Did you create something today with your kids? Absolutely. So we're supposed to be like God, let God be his witness, substitution, bringing order, proclaims God in divine relation. When you bring order, you glorify God. That's what you're created for. Okay. So here's Adam and Eve. Their archetypes created with more bottles, provision by God in the garden. Remember, God gives us everything you need. Okay. 
You have a role to serve, relationship, relationship with God, relationship with others, and relationship with spouse. So you have relationship, it doesn't make any difference, okay? All these three are what you're supposed to be doing. So here, we're coming to the end now. For Walton, the Bible and science debate causes people to leave the church. Well, I'm not going to their church. They don't, they don't preach what I know about creation because I believe it's, it's made in six days and other 24-hour days, and this is the way it is. But I heard him so that I'm leaving the church. Okay. Easy. Take a, yeah, take a chill pill. Right? Just because you have a different view on a non-essential and a learning because wisdom takes time to get, go easy before you blast your pastor on some insignificant thing because your pastor might change his mind 20 minutes later. Right? So, um, the Bible and science debate, and he's big on this. He says, uh, he says he has seen so many churches fail or break because of these particular stands on things, right? Okay. Scripture does not conflict with science. He'll, he'll tell you that. But Scripture was not intended to be a scientific book. It's not scientific. It wasn't intended to be scientific. It's Scripture. So he doesn't have a problem with 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 thing. Well, no, you want Kathy's going to come next week and she's going to teach us about grammar and literary devices. That's a skill I don't have like she has, right? And so what you do with your Chevy or your Ford or what do you got? A Ford. Okay, a Ford. I, I can't I can't do what you do with that, right? Okay, the next one. That came close to being a. This is what I want you to remember. <laughs> Genesis 1 is about function, not what or when, but how and why. Genesis 2 is about order, bringing order to non order. Okay. Somebody get a Bible out. And somebody turn to Genesis 1 7 and 8. Genesis 1. Verse 7 and 8a. Genesis. Wait, 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 wait. All right, do you have your Bibles open now? Okay. Okay. It's up on the screen. Because I don't know what your what your book is going to say if it's going to say permanent. So Susan, what's your say? waters that were below the expanse from the water, waters which were above and the expanse, and it was so. Okay, expanse, expanse. What do you got, Don? Expanse. What do you have, Dave? Well, ah, read yours, Dave. What Bible is that? Uh, it's the New King James Scofield. Oh, <laughs> I won't hold it against you. No. <laughs> <laughs> Read it. Now listen, to the, the, he's got a good translation. Listen to this one now. Listen, read that, Dave, nice and loud. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were above, under the firmament and the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. Hold it, stop. Who else has got one? You got one? Yeah. Read yours, nice and loud. Okay, so thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. Okay. Hang on to your seats. Remember I told you, I, I, I'm going to come with one of these, and, and here's, here's one. You'll go home tonight and say, I, I, think, I think Rick is whacked out on that. Where's heaven? Yeah, I should read that eight. It says, and God called the firmament heaven. Beautiful. Whoa, whoa. Oh. Yes, yes. Uh, read, your, read that nice and loud. Okay. And God called the firmament heaven, so the evening and the morning were the second day. Okay. Okay, okay, now here's where you can go home tonight and say, I'm not coming back, okay? The firmament was separated. You got the clouds in the sky with rain, right? Clouds in the sky. And you got the rivers and lakes and springs coming out of the water. And so God separated the two, and he created this land, which was Permanent, permanent, right? Dave, yours is permanent. And yours, yours was Susan? Expanse. Expanse. What was yours, Don? Expanse. Expanse. And what do you have, Janice? Expanse. Expanse, okay. Which, 
It's okay, but for a minute. Okay. NIV so has what? NIV has a vault. Is what? Vault. Vault. V a u l t. So we have the the clouds in the sky, and, and we have NIV. down here, and we have the firmament in the middle, which we are walking on. Now, uh, what's your what's your name, ma'am? Mary. Mary, please read all of verse seven and the first part of verse eight. his dad, right? And what did he say? Is this heaven? <laughs> no, this is Iowa. Right? That's no heaven. <laughs> but that's not what God says, is it? Read it again, please, Mary. Listen close. But God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament You're in heaven. Now, have you ever thought of that? <laughs> have you ever contemplated that God called the permanent heaven? And now, that's you, where I put the Garden of Eden, though. See, I always thought we were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, and it is on the earth. So we will... Heaven will be... So... I, I'm pretty sure no one has ever thought that you were in heaven or on heaven. Read it again, Mary. <laughs> Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. I, I don't know how to... I'm sorry, I can't be, I, they're not my words. I'm, I'm just telling you that he's telling you that the permanent, per permanent is heaven. So, I want you to think, before you come back, are you in heaven? Are you walking in heaven? You have to deal with that text. You have to deal with it. When I was putting this together today, I was watching a John Noe video, and he has this guy named Lynn Hiles, who is really, and Lynn Hiles brought this up in his presentation. That's why I brought it here tonight, because I thought, oh man, I, to me it was a God thing. To me it was a God. So Lynn Hiles talked about this thing, and he, he walked around the room, he said, you understand? Now most of you people here, you don't believe you're in heaven. I can't tell you what, but... God says, so you have to deal with the text, people. You have to deal with it. Okay. But is he equating the heaven or the firmament with earth or the space between the waters? Yeah, because if you read above, I mean, you right. can read a little bit above it. And but then define what, be. De define what, he what version of heaven this is because the Bible talks about different Love. heavens. It says in the book of Revelation, and the new earth, and the new right. heaven and new earth. The new heaven and new earth. It gives you a whole different perspective on heaven, doesn't it? You, you think differently now. You think, oh, and then, uh, I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. But to me, there's, I don't know what heaven is. I, I know, in general, I, I know it's going to be good. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be glad when I get there. But I don't know how it all works yet. Do you know, Rich? So, but the earth, as far as like what we know, and when I say earth, I'm talking about the exposed ground and how the Bible says how it came up out of, you know, how it came up out of the sea. I looked all that up in Hebrew, and it's actually, um, I actually wrote about it. It uses the Hebrew word mikvah. So like when you read in Solomon's temple with the bronze sea, 
They it would, it, it's a mental, and that actually is where we get the word uh, baptism from. And so the, the exposed ground, the earth, is actually a result of if looking at the Hebrew language of the first baptism because it came up out of the water. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. When you get to Revelation, he talks about the sea. And we think, when Revelation, we think, oh, the sea. It's the Atlantic Ocean. It's the Pacific Ocean. It's, it's, it's the sea. Um, no. They're talking about the sea of the temple of that water. Right? Well, but also an analogy for people. Or so that. What? Peoples. Peoples. Yes, yeah, because when we were created, we Peoples. came from the dust of the earth. We literally, yeah. we literally were created out of the, what was the first baptism. And it, I mean, like connecting the dots. Mm -hmm. Okay, any questions as we get to closing here? Any Anybody got anything? Janice, what do you think? Um, <laughs> it's a long process. But yes, I enjoy it very much. Any questions, comments? What are you thinking? I'm thankful for you being here. Dave, two cents. Don, come on. Any questions? Of it? Okay, what I want you to get is I want to prepare for Walter. I only did this so you can get ready when he comes, because he's going to be heavy. He, I, I, I'm just, I'm just, I serve the, on, uh, I serve the uh, appetizer, right? When he comes, it's going to get thick, and and I hope we can keep up with him. I know he's a smart guy, and, and I actually he already sent me his PowerPoint. He sent it to me, so I have it. I've seen it, right? And it's a, it's it's packed. Yeah, it's packed. Right? But he says he's given it before, and he says, I have two hours, and I can cover it. So he's done this before, so I feel really good about that. But next week is going to be this young lady. <laughs> tell, her, tell her that, Ron. Did you get a picture of that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll get a picture of it. <laughs> Kathy Wilma, she has a Master of Science in Business Ed. She's retired, and she knows literary devices. Now, she sent her first presentation, and she had like... 12 or 13 of them, I'm saying, you'll never get through them. You, you can't. So she cut it down, I don't know, seven, Ron? I think I think she's down to seven. Now. Yeah, I'm not and she's only sure. got to cover the key key ones, okay? Yeah. Um, uh, and so she's going to talk about biblical grammar. Are the words heaven and earth literal or figurative? Right? Right? Are, are they literal or figurative? Right? And it's going to uh, verbally, idiom, simile, but worse. Because when Jesus speaks, most of the time, he's He's saying, I am the door, I am the branches. He's speaking in so many, so many parables and stories. You, you can't, you, you have to understand the language that he's using. And remember, it's not written to you. So you have to think about, eh, what, what are they figuring out? Eh, how are they thinking about that? Right? I, to what you just said, um, I heard that when Jesus, uh, he, he would named himself the door. My entire life, that's a door behind you. It swings, that's it. But it doesn't mean that at all. It means Jesus laid in front of the, the cave where the, the sheep were held to protect. to protect. He would. You had to cross the shepherd to get out. So he was the door physically preventing those sheep from going out and getting killed. He's the block. Oh, Don, I had never he's, thought of that way. I had never... That's, I, I, no, I, I, that's what I was, I was done. You know, so I know exactly what you're talking about. This, this word. Oh, I had never thought of that. And he, and he, the shepherd laid down his life. <clears throat> wow. That's new to me. I, I, that's a new one. So next week is going to be Kathy. Um, it's going to be good. I've seen her presentation, too. We've been editing like we did with um and, and it's good. I like it, and it's and it's very edifying. And I'm I'm not going to be uh, obviously I'll moderate to make sure she moves and doesn't get stuck on certain things. Uh, so any questions, Mary? Did you enjoy tonight? Yeah, I think yeah. I think my takeaway would be is I'm all on point with. I think we all have gifts and talents, and I think that it's kind of sad that I don't see it used, you know, in a godly way. I think we're that's that's the purpose of life. We're all created. 
he equipped us. Oh, let's see it. Let's be the light. Let's be a city on a hill. Let's take the, right. you know, the light off the bushel and let, you know, the best thing. You know, I just, it's just a shame, you know. Yeah, but we'll listen to the enemy, the deceit. We'll right. listen to the problem. That's right. And then we'll say, oh, no, we don't know how to fix it. Yeah, I do. You'll yeah. tell me. Yeah, I mean, literally, it's a, he just makes it so easy for us. Right. And then we're like, oh, that's stupid. Yeah. yeah. It's, a, yeah. it's a hard is just use what he gives you and then be the light. We, our purpose is to bring the gospel, period. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So how are you using that? It should be, it should be in us and through us. Mm-hmm. We should really show joy of the Lord and like, you know, it's like, where is the virtue? Like, come on, you know? Mm-hmm. That's heaven on earth. Yeah, yeah, there you go. That's <laughs> permanent. Tommy, there, right? you got anything? I'm good. Donna? I'm good. <clears throat> anybody else? I, I picked on everybody. I, I picked on everybody. Urata, you got anything to say? I like this. So start thinking about um, what is it? Uh, function rather than stuff. Don't think about the creation as, oh yeah, the world was created and ended. Walton does not think that, right? And I had, I, until I read his books, I didn't think it the way he did either. I didn't, I just thought, oh yeah, I was created. I'm a young earth guy. Well, I'm a young earth guy, it was 28 men. 2,000 years ago, somewhere about that. God just created this, and the day was 24 hours. And, and it, well, now that I'm looking at this, I don't know what I am. Right? I don't know. Hey, the 24 matter. hours is order. Bingo, right? Bingo. And with the 24 hour thing, uh, and during the creation week, where he keeps saying evening, morning, the next day, the Hebrew words are Erev and Boker. And every single time outside of the creation week that those words appear like that in the entire Old Testament, it always indicates a 24-hour day. Always. Mm-hmm. But see, we and, can't, and, and we what can't. would Walton say? He doesn't care. Yeah. It's irrelevant. It's, no, it's irrelevant. And, and I know you're not arguing his, his position. I would say it matters because it actually, because if you go farther with it, it actually tells us something about Christ. Because the, there's a verse that says, uh, with the Lord a day is of a thousand years, a thousand years of a day. It, the creation week, if you look, if you actually take that approach, it actually lays out human history in advance, each day being of a thousand years. So my position, I'm a young... You're younger? Yeah. You? And my position, and not just because of this, but the scripture is actually really consistent in conveying this over and over again. So where he, he tells around the time of no man's days shall be numbered 120. That's a really weird way of saying that. Yeah. And it, you take 50 jubilees times the 120 years and you get the 6,000 years. And then with the Gospels where Jesus was going to Lazarus after he died, <clears throat> he intentionally waited two more days. So by the time he gets there, there's a... The, the number of days it takes, ma- it, okay. you just see that okay. pattern no, over and no, over no, again. Stop it. Okay. That's great. But what's your purpose? What, what, the, the, what I'm trying to say is that I agree the 24 I, I, is important. But what is the priority? Because, because, it, 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 because for me, for, for my, my belief and my understanding, yeah. and I know that you and I differ on that, but I actually but believe that, it, that it teaches us and there. speaks to no. what is still well, yet to come. Right. And that I, I believe that we're going to be entering into that time frame really with eschatology. <laughs> but, 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 but see, like, or, <laughs> we'll, open that, we'll open that door later. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, do, I do think order is part of function, though, because, because that it helps you regulate and, and take serious what your job is. Oh, thank you. Any questions? Comments? Thank you very much. Hope you had a good time. Happy birthday.